26. And I want to get right into the Word. A lot to do uh, tonight. Uh, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord for Bible study because watching online is dicey. Uh, and by the way, it's not because of our equipment. It is dicey because it's Cox Cable. And uh, we've had them out over and over again. It's They've acknowledged it's on their side. Uh, it's a traffic problem. It's a long story. But anyway, uh, of course, even if you're ever watching online and you have trouble with it, just know that give it a little while and the, the recording will be on the archive. So you can get it there without I apologize for all that. Just a recap, real quick recap. This was our text last week. Uh, God is our refuge and strength, and he is a very present help in trouble. And we talked about we're in troubles. We're in troubled times right now. But therefore we will not fear. Though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with a swelling thereof, no, in other words, no matter how bad it gets, here's the point, there is a river and the streams thereof make glad the city of God, holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. And, and no matter how bad troubled times get, we still have a river of the Holy Ghost that we can tap into. Can you say Amen. Now, last week, I started a, a little teaching thing that I call Coping with COVID. And uh, for all intents and purposes, this is kind of part two of it. Uh, but I'm, I'm having a different subtitle tonight that I'm calling The Philosophy of Life and Death. And I'm, we're going to really get into some philosophy stuff here that uh, we got led into by the, the COVID issues. But the truth of the matter is, it's way bigger. Than, than the COVID issues, it really touches base about everything, uh, of anything that causes life and death to us. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us tonight. In Jesus' name, Lord, thank you for the people of God that have gathered into your house, and I'm asking you to help me tonight to teach your word in a, in a clear manner and, and uh, to help your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. Wave it four or five folks. Whatever you do, don't get near them. My God. <laughs> now, give me give me just a minute to do a real quick recap. If you were not here last Wednesday night, you really need to go back in and listen to that before Facebook takes it down <laughs> because it already got flagged uh, just because of the... You know, they've taken videos down of our church claiming that we, we do not meet community standards. I got news for them. Our standards are a whole lot higher than the community standards. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, um, we're living in a time of censorship and, and, and all of that. And uh, you're seeing it on full display uh, th this week. But anyhow, while it's there, it, it'd be good to go and, and listen to it. We talked about the reality of this pandemic. It is a sickness. It's a real medical issue that's going on. And people have been very sick and people have been dying. And we're going to talk about that tonight. Now, thankfully, at this stage, we, we're uh, having just uh, less than a 1% mortality rate. So that's, that's something to be very, very thankful for. But still, there's a lot of sickness going on. Uh, we talked last week about the numbers, uh, why we believe they are exaggerated. And it's because there is an actual medical issue going on that politics got involved in. And that it was driven into it by spirit. Now, I believe that this is a man-made thing and, and evidence is, is heading that way. Uh, <clears throat> you know, by the way, sometimes people say, where's your evidence? Where's your evidence? Well, you know, if I've been robbed and I come home and my house is empty... I know I've been robbed, and I may have a real good idea who did it. <clears throat> just not able to prove it yet. So just, just because you're not able to fully prove something doesn't mean it's not true. You know, now, we're not talking about just making up stuff, you know, but, but sometimes you can trace the dots and make certain conclusions, and, and, and so we do that. And in the middle of it, this pandemic, we went into these lockdown things. That was supposed to be for two weeks. 
turned into nine months and no end in sight. And in the beginning, it was not something that was particularly targeting churches. It was hitting everywhere. I mean, if Disney World's closing down, I'm thinking, all right, I'm, I'm willing to do that. <laughs> But after a while, it became evident that politics had gotten involved in this and spirits. This all is driven by spiritual things got involved in it. And the pandemic was being used to target churches. Let me give you an example. Bring slide five up just for an example. I didn't show you this last week, but this is the one, you know, like somebody put a meme here. Everybody's in the airplane with a mask on and nobody's sitting in church. And does this make any sense? The answer is no, uh, it doesn't. Now, what do we do when, when we have spikes of this thing? We didn't know what to do in the beginning. We didn't know how to treat it and so forth. And so, yeah, you know, locking down, all right, it, it, it had some sense to it. But, but we can't remain in an ongoing state of lockdown because there's too many other things that are being damaged and hurt and destroyed. And uh, if we have an outbreak or a flare-up, which we did. We've had one so far that happened in the summer. And so we kind of drifted back. Okay, we locked down for a couple of weeks, three weeks, I think it was. Tamp it down, and we, then we come back. But the point, and if that happens again, by the way, that's the same thing we'll do uh, if, if within the church I'm talking about. But here's the point. But, but you, you respond, you know, because that's when you're trying to deal with the medical side of it. But when the, when the political, spiritual stuff gets all manipulated in the middle of it, uh, then, then this undue fear comes on us. And that's really what I was trying to address last week. I'm, I'm, I feel like the Lord is, is trying to lift the spirit of fear from, from our mind. Fear exaggerates things. You know, There is some normal things to be concerned about. There, there is some l sensible levels of concern that we should have, but it shouldn't jump into, into seizing fear where we're afraid to walk out the door. We're afraid to do anything like that. Um, and again, I went through lists of epidemics and pandemics that we've had in the past, and never, ever have we acted like the way we have acted in this past year. Now, where I'm really concerned is this. I'm concerned for the economic fallout, and it's going to be huge. Uh, it's already been some, but it's going to get worse. And the fallout is going to last longer than the pandemic itself because we have, we have made some overzealous restrictions and, and decisions of things that are going to, uh, that have created economic ripples that will unfold for months to come. Uh, now, again, the medical risk is real, but we need to, and we need to exercise some balanced caution, but not extremism. Uh, we're doing our best that we can to ride through crazy times, but our anchor is in the Word of God and being sensitive to the Spirit of God. And one of the things I said last week that I appreciated, the Supreme Court made a ruling, said the Constitution is not suspended in a pandemic, and I pointed out neither is the Bible suspended in a pandemic. And it's still the Word of God. Can you say amen? amen? And even in a time of trouble, it's even more precious. And more powerful. Hallelujah. Now, here's my big concern is the, over, the, the economic damage that's been caused by some of these ridiculous decisions we've made. For example, last week in the pilot local article here, they noted that, and, and I'll be honest with you, it's either 215 or 415. I can't remember which number that it was. That's how many businesses have shut down just here in Hampton Roads. That represents tons of jobs, hundreds of jobs. And that's just the beginning. There are others that are holding on by the skin of their teeth. And <clears throat> their jobs being lost. There's great distress that's going to be coming down the pike. And, and so our politicians said, well, that's okay. We'll create a stimulus check and take care of that. And then they gave us 600 bucks. <laughs> uh, and the reality is most of the money went to overseas crazy stuff. And uh, it, it's just, it's, it's despicable what, what, what it is. But there are many, many businesses that are filing bankruptcies. There's uh, 
that's going to lead to more and more households filing bankruptcies. You're going to see mortgages that are going to go into foreclosure. All of this stuff takes time for it to work its way through the pipeline. In New York City right now, there are so many people that have, have gotten so tired of the ridiculousness of New York City leadership and political stuff. They've been leaving the city left and right. There were, uh, I, th I think I heard a thing that there were 18% of all the apartments in New York City are sitting empty right now. Not collecting rents. Again, this is all heading toward a crisis. 40%, this was just this week's news, 40% of New York City's small businesses are expected to fail over the next year. And in the middle of all of that, our new president that's coming in next week has already indicated that he intends to raise taxes. That's a brilliant idea. <laughs> How do you raise taxes on, on an economy that's already hurting so bad? Um, it, 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 it's, uh, we are going to reverse uh, energy policies and stuff like that that have been incredibly successful. So my point is what I'm looking for for the next couple of years is not going to be uh, good things economically. Um, there is uh, uh, things that are being pushed that are going to be promoted that, that are going to make no economic sense whatsoever. And here's my point about it. It's all driven by the pandemic. It's all blamed on the pandemic. It's all licensed because of the pandemic. I mean, after all, we have to do stupid stuff because we have a pandemic. That's the logic of it. And that is a spiritual thing. Now, in the meantime, there's some legitimate questions that the people of God have a right to, to ask. I, I call it, there, there's some questions of faith. Uh, and in the middle of this pandemic, we have seen Christian people, good people, uh, that have not only gotten sick, but, but some that have died. I personally have lost seven or eight friends, ministers, uh, and it seems untimely. I remember the first one that happened was my friend Eli Hernandez, who was only 60 years old, and it, it just seems so untimely to me. Everybody say untimely, because mm -hmm. that's the ones we wrestle with more than anything is the untimely ones. How can God, and I even told the Lord, I, I was talking to him, I, I said, God, I, I, I trust you. I, 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 you know, I know you got a handle on this and you got a purpose for what you do, but, uh, but we're, we're on the verge of, of, a, of a time of ingathering, and I don't understand why you're allowing some of the pieces to be taken off of the board at, at a critical time. I, I, I didn't understand, still don't understand it. So I didn't come here tonight to give you a specific answer to all of this, but I have come tonight to discuss some philosophy behind it that will help keep your faith in check. The, the, the people are asking, where, why is God letting saints and ministers die? Uh, why isn't God stopping this? You know, why, why isn't God doing... I mean, after all, if it is evil, and I do believe that it is, it, it has an evil origin to it, the, the legitimate question is, is why isn't God stopping the evil? Uh, last couple of weeks, Brother Orozco out in California, it was stunning. Uh, he was only 66 years old, the pastor of the largest church and network of churches in our whole fellowship, and just died uh, quickly of, of covid and of all the people, to, to think, I, there, there's a list of prophets, men that are prophets. We lost three or four men that are prophetic. Uh, I don't mean just used in gifts of prophecy, but are prophets in the office of prophets. And I'm just, uh, I'm stunned. Irvin Baxter, uh, which, you know, Brother Baxter, of course, was a great end time teacher. He, he believed that, that the church was going to go, you know, uh, at the at post uh, tribulation and we couldn't help but note Brother Baxter ended up going pre-trib. <laughs> but the, the, the question is why? I can't believe I just lost my shoe. <laughs> you ever have just one of them days? <laughs> I'm having one. So here's the, here's the question. The virus appears to be man-made, and if its origin is, is evil... Satan is obviously using it for manipulation and bringing about more evil. And, and, and for thousands of years, he has thousands of years of experience 
in deception and dealing with humans. So if, if all of this is true, then why doesn't God stop it? Now here's the thing. That is the age-old atheistic complaint against faith. So we're asking it freshly in this pandemic, but the truth of it is we've been asking this question for hundreds of years. Why does he allow evil if God is so good? And the only way that we can begin to address it is we have to swerve into some philosophy tonight. And we need to get some biblical philosophy. Bring up, uh, turn with me and bring up on screen Ecclesiastes 12. Solomon is writing, here's what he says, And further, by these, my son, be admonished. The making of many books there is no end, and of much study is weariness of the flesh. And anybody that's ever been to high-end school knows how that is. You can read so much and study so much and try so hard to understand some things, uh, and it'll make your head hurt. <laughs> so Solomon said, so and, and what's the bottom line? What's the summation of all of this? What, if you could sum up all the knowledge, everything that can be learned, what's it really boiled down to? It comes to verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Everybody say fear God. The Hebrew word would, probably would have been better translated in English to reverence God, but that's typically what we mean anyway when we say fear God. And keep his commandments for this, everybody say this, is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment and with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now that word duty, he said that's the whole duty of man. Duty meant a moral obligation. So what Solomon is writing, he said, he said after, again, this is a man endued with great wisdom from God. And he concludes, uh, after examining the whole thing, everything about life and this and that, the bottom line is uh, the, the moral obligation of every human being uh, is to reverence God and to serve Him. Well, that's the Old Testament witness. Bring up Matthew chapter 22, and Jesus Himself gave the New Testament witness. Jesus said in verse 37, Unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul. They asked him, by the way, what's the greatest commandment? He said that you should love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second's like unto it, that you should love thy neighbor as thyself. So when, when, when you're saying... I, I, I want to know what my purpose is. I want to know what I'm supposed to be doing. Well, number one, the generalized purpose that's true for all of us is the first level of responsibility we have is we should be loving God. We should be honoring God, reverencing God, and loving Him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our might. And then after we love God, we need to start treating each other right. Yeah, I say. <laughs> Another one that just passed away in the last few weeks uh, what, in what seemed to be an untimely uh, death was Dr. Ravi uh, Zacharias, who was a, a great apologist for Christianity. And he had a great comment in response to this. He said, the highest ethic that God taught us in the Word of God is to love. That's our highest responsibility. It's the highest thing we can attain to. And after all, it's the highest thing we can do to be like Him because God is love. But now here's where it gets complicated. Love requires that we value God and that we value one another. You cannot love something you don't value. And love is the greatest power. Now, here's where it gets interesting, because when we sit back and we say, there's evil going on all around us, how come God isn't stopping it? Well, sometimes He does, and He certainly puts the brakes on it here and there and delivers us at times, but in general, we know that we are living in a fallen, broken world that is, that is full of evil. But here's the deal. It would be impossible for us to love if we did not have the free will in order to do so. The thing that we, we, we 
buff over sometimes, way too easy, it is when we talk about that back in the garden, well, God gave us free will, and then we, we, we bounce on to, to other things. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we need to spend some time on that. Do you understand that probably the greatest gift that God gave us is the ability to have free will, even though some of us have made a wreck with it? But it is still the greatest gift that God could have given us. And, and if God immediately decided to just snuff out every evil every time that it flames up somewhere, you have to understand it would end up putting us in a box that would cause us to be more like cyborgs rather than human beings. And we would, not, we would only, here, here's what it would be, do. If all I knew, if, if I just had to do everything, God, you know, you're going to come in and, and hold a gun to my head and say, pick up that piece of trash? Okay. <laughs> I will comply. Better not hope what I'm saying under my breath, you hear. <laughs> but I will comply. Everybody say comply. comply. Now, why am I going to comply? I, I, I would be able to comply without free will, but I am not able to. To love without free will. I have to have the ability to choose between simple compliance and whether or not I love. And some things I comply with and other, because I don't have a choice. Other things I can choose to do because that is my choice. Now the atheist that looks at all of this and assumes that God has no credible reason that he should allow evil in the world. If God is so good, then how come he does this? And, and they assume that God does not have a legitimate reason for allowing this level of, of of, of evil. Again, he didn't make us as, as cyborgs. We are not robots. We are human beings. Uh, and God created us uh, in the beginning in his image. Uh, and he gave us uh, the greatest gift of all was the ability to choose. It's the right of self-will. And in order for that to mean anything, then it means we have to have available choices. Like, like, like right now, sorry about this, Brother Barnes, but right now, the only choice I got for our Internet service is Cox. <laughs> so I comply. <laughs> so, well, you, you know, you, you don't have to, yeah, I, I, I don't have a choice. I comply because I don't have a choice. If you're going to give me the right to choose, then you also have to give me Something to choose from. Because without the options on the table, the right to choose is meaningless. So if God snuffed out every evil, every bad thing that was about to happen to us, and, and every wrong thing that was ever happening, you have to understand what he would also be snuffing out is our ability and our right to make choices. Now, some of us may make the argument, well, I ain't been doing too good at making choices, God. Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> well, that may not be a bad idea, but he is not going to really take the wheel. He, he wants you and I to choose. Now, this is the rationale that God employs. His justification is... In judging us. That's why at the end of time, when all this is said and done, and people get upset because, uh, uh, well, why would God, why would a good God send people to hell? Well, number one, hell wasn't made for people. The Bible is very clear that hell was made for the devil and his angels. And they, it was created as a place because of the poor choice they made. But when humanity in such large numbers begin to make the same choice based on their influence, uh, the Bible says hell hath enlarged itself. And the justification for putting humans in the hell is the exact same justification of putting angels there as well to begin with. Second Thessalonians, on screen. Second chapter, verse 8. 
And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Because. Everybody say because. Yell it again. Say it again. Now watch very carefully. God is ta- he's talking here about how the Lord is going to come and deal with wickedness. He's going to deal with Satan. He's going to deal with all the corruptness that was corrupted because of him. And when it comes down to the human level, he's going to, he's going to deal with them because they receive not a love for the truth that they might be saved. They were not not saved because they couldn't be. They were not saved because they chose not to be. And for this cause, everybody say this cause. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in righteousness. Now there is a place that the Bible says that, you know, some of us are worried about being judged at the white throne. There's a lot of judgments that take place before the white throne. The white throne is simply the formalization of things. And, and the Lord is literally, Paul is literally saying there that there are times that God chooses to prejudge us. Because he watches the fact we don't love truth, we don't want nothing to do with truth, we've chosen other things besides truth. And the Lord said, okay, if you don't want anything to do with truth, then I will allow you to believe a lie. And that will, of course, eventually lead you to damnation. You say, well, that's God's fault. No, it was God's choice based on our choices. You see, good and evil, holy and unholy, have to be available to every one of us in order to validate the right that we have to choose. So many people say, I I just wish God would just take the choices away. I wish God would just... just..." No, you don't want that. Because if if you did that, you would not have the opportunity for the incredible things that lay in wait for the people of God that chose him. Paul said when he saw it, he said, I hath not seen and ear hath not heard. It hasn't even entered into the heart of man. Nobody has been able to imagine, Paul said, what I've seen. But he was not permitted to, to tell it all. He just said, I, I can't share it. But I, I just want you to know that, that it's there. But it's only available to those who have made a choice. So Jesus made it very clear. Uh, bring up Mark chapter 8. That the soul is the most valuable thing we have. If you thought the most valuable thing you have is your house or your car, you're woefully mistaken. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if it gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That's why it's amazing to watch people lose their soul chasing after the things of the world. When Jesus said, if you gained it all, and by the way, ain't nobody I know of getting it all. (laughs) Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What would you choose to say is more valuable than your soul? Verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Uh, My soul and your soul has such incredible high value that Jesus said it's more valuable. One soul is more valuable than the whole world. Now that leads us to the next question. What is, what, what is our flesh? What's the value of our flesh? Well, there's a couple of things. One, if you're talking about just market value of what, you know, what makes us flesh, it ain't much. Uh, honest to Pete, it's, if you took the human body and broke it down in a lab, it'd be less than 50 bucks worth of materials. So our value is not in the flesh. Now, if you want to know what makes flesh valuable, it's the fact that it houses, for now, our soul. 
And this is the place where our soul is, and so it does have value. But the, but the only thing that really gives it value is it comes from the greatest value of all. So when you get it backwards and start chasing things of the flesh and willing to give up the things of the soul, you got it totally in reverse. You're chasing after what isn't worth much and willing to give up what is worth everything. And that choice, by the way, annoys God who paid for us to have the right to make the choice. to be. He won't take the choice away, but he will hold us accountable to it. Which brings us to another question. All right, so why, th- th- we go to the philosophy of life and death. Why am, am, why am I alive? Why am I here now? I mean, I, I, I will be honest with you and tell you, uh, the way I think and, and believe about things, I've often felt like I was born out of my time. <laughs> Feel like a dinosaur in some way. I look at some of the craziness going on in our world and think, I, 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 don't, I don't even fit in here. <laughs> and yet, here I am. <laughs> you know, one time Mordecai I talked to Esther and he said he was, she was coming into a very opportune time to go before the king that could save the the Jewish people and he said who who knows but what you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this truth is it turns out that Esther was absolutely born for her time now here's the real reality so were we I may feel like I fit into another uh, time period but I don't this is this is the one I am born for. This is the one that I am at. We are living now. But the question is, why are we living now? Why am I here today in this generation? Because, well, one thing we know for sure, we don't control our birth. I mean, I had nothing to do with my birth. Don't even remember it. It must have happened because here I be. But I had nothing to do with it. And I was born back in the early 60s. You know, it's depressing when you're filling out those little digital things that we do, you know, on the credit cards and it comes to fill in the year and you have to scroll. (laughs) I can't even move my mouth. I got foom, foom, foom. And I remember when I started having this, oh, my God, <laughs> am I really getting this old? And the answer is yes. I got the scroll to prove it. I got a scroll all the way down. The, now, according to, uh, according to my birth date, I, I, can, uh, I can get a pretty strong estimate about when my mother and father, the year prior, got together (laughs) and my mother became pregnant with me so the conclusion must be right well yeah see there it is I'm just a fluke of timing I'm just a fluke because I had no choice in being born and it always amazes me when I hear people that are fighting with depression or whatever, and they're, they're feeling sorry for themselves. You know, why, 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 was, I, why was I born? I, I wish I hadn't even been born. Do you, you understand how off base that is from truth and reality? Because you're assuming that your birth was just some nonsensical thing. Now, on a technical note, I think it should be noted that God created Adam and Eve. That was the only w- humans that he actually created. From He formed them from earth, and from that point, he gave humans the ability to procreate. And so we do not have to have God's permission. Some of you have proved that. We don't have to have God's permission to procreate because he gave that 
to humanity. But don't assume that just because he allowed humans to make choices about procreation uh, that he still has nothing to do with it. God gave us the ability to procreate uh, and then we can choose whether to procreate or not and we can have a lot to do with the timing of it. And he put into women particularly the incredible gift and ability to become image makers. He made Adam and Eve in God's image and then said to Eve, now you from here on out, woman is going to be the image maker. You're going to make the new images. But don't assume that God didn't have something to do with this stuff. Acts 17 on screen, when Paul was uh, on Mars Hill, he, he was arguing the, the philosophy about God. He said, it's God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, uh, as though he needed anything that he, seeing he, everybody say he, giveth to all life and breath and all things. And hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And, not only that, now watch this. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Paul's argument is God created all of us uh, and he created every one of us uh, with an appointed times. And he appointed all of us with bounds of our habitation. In other words, the rules how it's going to unfold. Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. You see, it keeps coming back to the purpose. God allowed humans to procreate and he allows his spirit to come upon it and, and allow children to be born, whether or not he ordered it up. But, but when he gets involved in it, he still puts his soul within that child. And all of us are born with the reality that we are to seek him. We are born to love God. We are born to, to find God. And not only find God and fall in love with God, but we were born to find our purpose in God. Even though God allowed humans to procreate, He set the times and the bounds, and our first general purpose of life is to seek God. And yes, parents play a big role in the date of when life begins, but, but understand, I had nothing to do with when I was born but I cannot assume that God was not paying attention. Bring up Je Jeremiah 1. He came to the prophet Jeremiah one time. And he said, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I ordained thee a prophet unto all nations. Now this is powerful because God was literally telling him, I knew you, Jeremiah, when you were still in your mother's womb. I knew you before you were born. And not only did I know you, but I know for what purpose I had decided for your life. In his case, it was to be a prophet. And God said, I, I saw it before you were even born. I sanctified you. I ordained you. Can I remind you, he filled John the Baptist while, with the Holy Ghost while he was still a fetus in his mother's womb? God knew before I was born what my purpose was going to be. I am not an accident. And neither are you. Now we may have been unplanned, but we are not unseen. We may have parents who said, oh man, I wasn't expecting that. But God wasn't, isn't caught off guard. 
I did not exist physically yet. He was telling Jeremiah, before you even physically existed, I knew you. I ordained you. I had a choice for you. Now, how can that be? How can he know us before we even exist? Uh, it, it's the same way that the architect can draw the plans of a house uh, before it's ever built. Uh, and then after it's building, look at it. Yeah, he said, I saw it before it even came to be in them. That's what it means that it said that he was, that he was uh, slain before the foundation of the world. The architects of it all saw it before it was built out. After construction, he can say, I saw it. I saw it. Jeremiah, you may be just now finding out what your life purpose is. But I knew it and was drawing it up before you were even born. Then, verse 6. Here's Jeremiah's response to this new knowledge. And then said I, oh! Lord God. Well, that's deep, Jeremiah. <laughs> oh, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. He starts now explaining to God why he's not qualified to do what God said he was born to do. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go unto all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Uh, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. But God did not give him his life purpose or the understanding of his life purpose uh, until well into adulthood. So just because you don't know your life purpose quite yet does not mean you don't have one. I believe biblically everyone that is born has a purpose in God, a calling, a gifting, if you want to call it that way, a reason, a, a something that God, uh, you know, at Christmas we like to say he's the reason for the season. Well, I need to know that there is a reason for my season. Why am I here? I don't know how long I have, I, 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 but why am I here in this time? Not everyone finds their purpose in life, but you should be seeking it. Bring up Acts 13. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. In other words, when David was done serving his generation, the Lord took him. Now I have a question. Who else's generation is he going to serve? Who, who else's generation are we going to serve? He blesses my, David blesses my generation because I can go back and read history about him. But the truth of the matter is the only reason that gives me any blessing today is because he fulfilled his life purpose. And he lived up to the reason that God had for his life. And so if I was made for a purpose and you were made for a purpose, uh, then what happens when that time of purpose, either we, we miss it and we, don't, we never find it, or what happens is when it's done? Well, according to David, it said after he had served it, it said then he fell asleep, or in other words, he passed away. Bring up Ecclesiastes 3. Famous, famous, famous verses. To everything, there is a season. That includes us, by the way. To every purpose, there is a season. To every person, there is a season. A time for every purpose under the heaven. That includes my purpose and your purpose. And then he said, a time to be born and a time to die. That's one of the things that was put into the parameters of, 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 of seasons. That every one of us have. And he listed 13 seasons in that chapter. And not only the, not only the, 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 the season, but the counter season. There's a time to be born and the counter to it, a time to die. Time to plant and the counter, the time to pl pluck up that which is planted. 13 times the counters all together was 26 seasons that he said was appointed under man. And as I already said, I have no control over the time of my birth. But God knew me in my mother's womb just as if he just the same as he knew you. And I may 
exercise some control over the time of my death, either by reckless living or suicide. By the way, that's why oftentimes suicide can be a sin. Because it's not just that you snuffed out a life, but that you took away God's purpose in your life. It is the same rationale. Now, that doesn't mean that all I, I, I one minister really brought some, some clarity to this. You know, sometimes there's people that commit suicide not because of a, of a conscious choice, but sometimes, you know, we can get heart disease, we can get liver disease or kidney disease. Sometimes we can get brain disease where the organ just begins to fail us and there's medications involved and psychotropic drugs and all kinds of stuff. You know, there's, all, there's, kind of, there's a lot of things that can play into it. But oftentimes... It's a sinful situation. It's the same rationale for why abortion is a sin. Most, most of the time, there's abortion, there's going to be a sinful situation. And here's the thing. The, 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 the reason why we want to get into the argument of whether it's a human being or not, which to me is a dumb argument to start with, but that's not even the whole point. The greater theological point, the philosophical point, is that not only is that a, a, a person that's going to fully develop into a person, but, but it is a person that has a, a, a divine purpose in God. And when you snuff that out, you are stealing it from God. That's why Charles Spurgeon, back in the 1800s, famous preacher, Everywhere that he went in to preach, he preached to thousands. Everywhere he went in, they used to sit all the kids in one section. That's when they could get them to behave. And he would walk in, and he would stop what he's doing and go out of his way to the children's section and tip his hat. Every time. But finally, they asked him, Mr. Spurgeon, why do you keep tipping your hat to the, to the children? They're just little children. What He said, because I don't know who I may be tipping my hat to. I might be tipping my hat to the next prime minister. I might be tipping my hat to a great physician that's going to going to cure diseases. I may be tipping my hat to you know he goes on to use a few examples, but he said uh, he said they're just children now, but we it is remain to be seen what they are going to become, what we shall be. So let's go. So we're just theologically working through this. I'm born with a purpose. I'm born with a general purpose to love God, seek God, and to seek after my purpose in God, my secondary purpose, my work, so to speak. What happens if I am in my purpose and I'm doing my purpose and I come to the end of my purpose? Bring up 2 Timothy. Chapter 4, the Apostle Paul said, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. Now watch this. I have finished my course. Everybody say course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. What Paul was literally saying is, I, the reason that I'm going to receive a crown is because I finished my purpose. When he said, I finished my course, he was not talking about, okay, I've finished my life. It was the opposite. He said, I'm now ready to die because I finished my purpose. The time of my departure is at hand. Now, my question is, why is he just now getting ready? Because he got saved years ago. 2 Corinthians 11, he's given his testimony in verse 24. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. Man. This guy's like a cat. Got nine lives. And he's just cranking them out right after another. 
in journeys often, in perils of water, perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils of the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness and watchings often, in hungers and thirsts and fastings often, in cold and nakedness. And you know what? Beside all that, that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, is the care of all the churches. In other words, he was talking about the mental stress and strain that goes along with leadership. Now, do you understand when you read that list, that was Paul's test, do you understand that just about every one of the things he listed could have and probably should have killed him? It killed others. And it was obvious that the enemy tried to kill him over and over and over again. And he was just like Gumby. He just kept popping back up. (laughs) Any one of those things could have taken him out. And here's the point. They probably would have back when he was still Saul. Because he hadn't found his purpose yet. But when the Apostle Paul found his purpose and he engaged himself in the purpose of why God created him and what God wanted to do with his life, uh, there came upon him a hedge of protection that no devil in hell could even begin to to kill him uh, because uh, there is a protection that comes upon the people that are fulfilling their purpose. greatest gift that God ever gave me outside of salvation itself, the opportunity to know him, was to allow me to find a purpose for my life. Jesus died because his purpose became completed. Now in his case, his death was his purpose. But he said, mine hour hath not yet come. Didn't matter who wanted to kill him. Didn't matter what the devil wanted. He was fulfilling a purpose. And when that purpose was done, his flesh was done. When the apostle Paul's purpose was done, he said, I'm ready to be offered. George Washington. And and by the way, this, this isn't just for Christian people. They're... There's, there's different reasons and purposes that God had. You've heard me say this before, George Washington. It's a historical notation. He was shot in the Revolutionary War, and when he got out of his uniform one night, had a bullet hole in the front and the back and no wound. He didn't even know he'd been shot. I would present to you it was because under normal circumstances that would have been the end. But that man had a divine purpose that was being fulfilled in his life. And God was going to protect him until the purpose was over. So in other words, what gave him the greatest value or what gave any of us the greatest value is when we are finding and fulfilling and being engaged in our purpose. Again, they tried to kill Jesus. said, mine hour is not yet come. Bring up John 21. Do you, you realize that P- Peter, that Jesus literally said to Peter, now, now remember, all of the you know disciples ended up having early deaths. But Jesus literally told Peter that he would have long life, but that he would also be crucified as a martyr. Bring up verse 18. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, he's talking to Peter, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walked where, whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. But this spake he, signifying of what death he should what? Huh? How can you be glorifying God being crucified? What brought glory to God was that he was finishing his course. 
And when he had thus spoken, he said unto him, follow me. He literally had told him right up front, in his case, you're going to have an old age or an older life. Now, the truth of the matter is none of us know how long we're going to live. Sometimes God may give us a little snippet of understanding like that, but no wonder, no wonder he was calm and asleep that night in the jail and the angel had to come bust him out. And you ask yourself, how can a man sleep when, when you know, he's in the middle of all this drama? I believe the reason he could is because he remembered the prophecy that's on him. Now, he didn't know how he was going to get out of it. And it surprised him the way it happened. I believe, you can call me naive if you want, but I believe that life and death are in the hand of, of the Lord. Especially if our purpose is being accomplished and worked on. That's why there's certain things we don't have to live in fear of. I, I don't have to fear everything. It's not, it's not bravado, nor is it ignorance. It's faith. It's the peace of the Holy Ghost. An evangelist friend of mine taught me something years ago that when we were doing a lot of traveling overseas and stuff, and I, and I, I thought, man, that's a great idea. And I, I got the, the idea, and to this day I do it. Every time that I'm flying and I'm getting on an airplane, as I'm walking on uh, across the thing, going into the thing, I put my hand on the fuselage of that plane, and, and as softly I'll just say, I call this equipment into the service of the king. I don't think this plane's going down because I'm on it. <laughs> Not because I'm bravado, but it's because what makes me valuable is I'm fulfilling my purpose in Him. When we are filling, fulfilling purpose, there's, there's an anointing that goes along with it. I honestly believe nothing is licensed to take me out until my purpose is completed. Now Satan can touch us. And he I mean he you know, we can get sick, we can have, we can have all kinds of issues that can arise. And he could touch Job, but he couldn't kill him. As a matter of fact, many of you you know Satan got frustrated because of everything he did to Job. And he complained to God. God put it, you see my servant Job? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you let me add him. What's the matter? You got a hedge about him. You know what's the matter. Because Job wasn't done his purpose yet. So God's hand was protecting his life. Now, it didn't protect his health and everything going on. Again, I'm not, I'm not telling you that it's, it's all ease at times. The, the enemy, you know, things can happen to us that can be unpleasant. But, but, but the, the bottom line to it was the quality of life may have been affected, but he had a hedge, and it wasn't until the Lord lowered the hedge. And even when he did, he told him, he said, I'll take the hedge down, and you can touch him, but you can't kill him. Not everyone can have that kind of peace of mind. You have to be involved in God's purpose. It rains on the just and the unjust. Trouble comes to all. But thank God there is a river. Even when all Hades is breaking loose. Matthew 7, quickly on screen. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. Everybody say, the will of my Father. 1 John 2, for all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. That's all, that's all that's happening on the fleshly level. 
And it's not of the Father, but it's of this world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. It's not about breathing. It's about doing the will of God. Hebrews 9 and 27. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment... Well, what exactly are we being judged about? We are being judged on the choices that we used our free will to pursue during our life. Now, God may change the parameters and length of our purpose. He may change our purpose and assignments, duties. And he may even shorten some unexpectedly. And when that happens, I'm not talking about the general population. I'm not talking about just every old body. But I'm talking about when we ask, but why is God allowing this to affect the church? This pandemic is what started this whole conversation. Why, why are the saints getting sick? Why have we had saints die? And why have we had ministers die? People that were being used of God. Again, I will tell you, there are some that the word untimely certain, certainly seems to fit. And when a saint or a minister dies untimely, the question is, did the devil kill him? Well, I think the reality is to, to, to see all this from a biblical worldview if we believe everyone is born with a purpose, everyone has a purpose, if we are involved in fulfilling our purpose uh, and the time comes for us to die, we have to assume for the godly person, particularly the saint or the minister, we would have to assume for consistency's sake that God decided his course or her course was complete. Now, it may not make a lot of sense to us. So why, would, why would someone's course end at 60 and someone else's end at 80? I don't know the answer to that. And no, none of us are going to know the answer to that. But I can tell you this. Psalms 116 on screen says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Even when we lose one of us in what appears to be an untimely thing. One thing we have to remember, it's, it's a grief on our side. It's a pain we're feeling for our loss, but it's not a pain for them. If anything, it's great for them. Because there's nothing greater than dying, having fulfilled your purpose and call of God and and die saved, full of the Holy Ghost. Now that brings us into an interesting sidebar for which I know I'm not going to be able to finish tonight. One of the problems that I see in the kingdom of God, it's always been an issue, but I really see it in our modern time. We have too many people who engage in the church and engage in the altar and engage in the walk with God and, and really, if the truth be known, the thing that's the motivator at the, at the root of it all is that they're really just trying to save their carcass. It's all about being saved. Now listen, I don't want to go to hell. I get it. And that kind of fear of the Lord and fear of the Lord, that's, that's not a bad thing to, 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 to motivate you out of neutral. And get you started toward a search for God. But if it never grows out of that, you're never going to make it anyway. In other words, they live their life, even though they come to church. But everything about their life, it, 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 it's like it never enters their mind about they need to do something to serve God. They just, they just want to go to heaven. I just want to be saved. As a matter of fact, some people are so determined to live life about their own cause and their own agenda that even when they're trying to walk with God and be saved, again, it's, it's not, they're not living life because they fell in love with His purpose. They're just trying to be saved. 
And there are those people who almost try to even gamble with their death date. I mean, let's be honest. If we knew our death date, many people would just simply take advantage of God's grace all the way up to the day before. And we get excited about deathbed salvations and deathbed repentances. Now listen, and I'm thankful when I believe me, e even if your life fulfilled no purpose that, that you were originally called to do, just to be saved is better than being lost. But if your only goal is to walk golden streets, then if that's really all you really care about is just getting yourself saved, then all right, uh, trying to have a near-death, new-birth experience, I, I guess that's a possible option. But how in the world do you know? I know many who put only little levels of effort into their Christianity and their walk with God. And I just want to help you understand something tonight, especially you young people hear me. That is incredibly short-sighted. Well, why? Heaven is heaven, right? It's the same for everybody, right? Not exactly. There is something more to be considered before you just opt out for laziness sake. I just want to come to church to be saved. I don't want to do nothing. I don't want to participate in nothing. I don't want to have to work at nothing. Leave me alone. I want to do my own thing. I'm going to, do, I'm going to live life for my agenda. My, for, but I do, I do want to be saved. And I, Okay, listen. Luke chapter 18, real quick. Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that have left house or parent or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake. In other words, for purpose sake. Who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come life everlasting. Now folks, listen. This thing called heaven is not about trying to be saved so that we could play a harp floating around the heavens. That is an idiotic, cartoonish idea that has no biblical foundation whatsoever. So, well, I just want to walk golden streets and I'm going to... Well, you know, here's the thing, biblically... <laughs> We're, we're not really going to spend all that time in heaven to begin with. It's mostly going to be played out on the new earth, starting with a thousand-year millennial reign, where during that time we become his government administration. Just like right now, the, the, the president-elect is choosing his cabinet and choosing who's going to do what. And this one, I'm going to nominate this one, that one. Every kingdom has to come in and do that same thing. They have to establish uh, the choices of who is going to do what in their kingdom. Now, the Bible says that, the, that in that day when he comes, the government shall rest on his shoulders. He is going to be king of kings and lord of lords, and of his government there shall never be an end. That's actually what more of eternity is about than walking golden streets, playing harps in the clouds. So here's the question. If he's king and the church that returns with him are his subjects, we're not just his subjects, we are his staff, we are his government, we are his servants. How do you think God is going to choose the various positions for his kingdom? How do I write my resume? 
How do I present myself to him for further service? I can tell you that it's only those that have served him with excellence that are going to fully get the opportunity to continue to serve him with even greater excellence. And the parable of the pounds, which we don't have time to get into tonight, but we'll pick up with it next week. The parable of the pounds, I think actually was all about resume building. We'll get into that next week. I don't want to just be saved. I don't want to just make it into heaven by the skin of my teeth. I don't want to live by my own agenda, my own flesh, my own choices, and then try to time this thing right. Maybe I'm lucky. And I'll figure out a way to repent before I die. I don't really care as long as I can make it. As long as I, well, again, making it is incredibly valuable. I don't underscore that at all. But if, if, if the only reason you want to go there is that, you have missed the purpose of why you were created to begin with. The ultimate reality of what we shall become when we ultimately fulfill our purpose is things that are going to unfold long after we die. Well, I have sufficiently killed the atmosphere of the room. <laughs> I can feel it coming from some of you. Say what? <laughs> Stand with me. Next Wednesday night, we'll pick up with this a little more. Philosophy of life and death. What happens when you or not not what happens when you die, but why do I die? Why do people die at different ages and stages and all that? That's kind of what we're talking about. Would you lift your voice and just praise God right now? Just love Him, Jesus. We thank you for your anointing that's in this house. We thank you for your Spirit. And I thank you for your Word tonight, Lord. And I know I wasn't able to finish uh, this topic. We need to talk more about it because we haven't hit the angles yet of it all. But I'm asking you to help us and take this word, Lord, and stir our hearts and stir our spirits with it. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I say to all the young people here tonight, don't waste your youth chasing after stuff. created you for a purpose and you need to hunger after